Okay. This is my grandfather in 1985. Just run through a dummy. What, what camera I look at? That one? Like it, this, one. this one here. I was only three when this was taken, and within a year and a half, my grandfather would be sick enough that he had to go live with his oldest daughter, my mom. By 1987, two years after this interview, my grandfather departed. This is the last recorded interview he gave about his investigation, and I thank Russ Gorman for going and interviewing Phil on a cold January day. Good evening, I'm Russ Gorman. Tonight we're going to be talking about the Boston Strangler. Forty years ago he terrorized the city of Boston. Tonight we're going to be talking to people who knew Albert DeSalvo. We'll first hear from the lead detective on the case, Phil Di Natale, who worked as chief investigator on the Attorney General's Strangler Bureau and was the first to be convinced that Albert DeSalvo was indeed the Boston Strangler. We'll hear about good old-fashioned police work and how politics played into the decision not to prosecute Albert DeSalvo. On the first murder, uh, we started with the uh, uh, interviewing everybody in the building uh -huh. and neighbors, and then start checking backgrounds where she worked and talked to people who they, uh, that uh, Ann Slesser worked with. Homicide did a great job. Boston Homicide did a great job on that. I've watched this interview so many times, it's easy to see what type of person Phil was. He was more interested in talking and joking with the crew than he was with the person interviewing him. About the only time he smiled was when making a joke about a crew member's car getting towed. Wait, my car. <laughs> you sure? <laughs> It'll disappear around here. <laughs> okay, Russ. Okay. But in this interview, Phil shows Russ his diagrams, explains the behind the scene politicking of the investigation as a cause of there never being a conviction, as well as why he is still so pissed off about it all. I can only imagine him rolling around in his grave to this day. I was very upset over the whole thing. I thought the public should know that he was or wasn't the Boston Strangler until they can rest at ease over the whole situation. It became very political and uh, I didn't want to get involved. Uh, when you get a, like a small grape with me with big apples, you can get squashed, which I did get squashed. But the other thing I found interesting was how proud he was of the detective agency and having his two sons take over the business. He branched out on his own in 1968 after leaving the Boston Police Department, which was no easy feat to give up a pension. I started on an orange crate in a lawyer's office, and from there I developed it and I took his place over uh, about a year after I got away from that lawyer, and I went on my own, and I started to work, and I drew up some letters. I had my daughter type up a lot of letters. I went to a lot of attorneys, delivered by hand, walked all around the city, shaking hands, buying cocktails at a bar, and telling me if you need me, call me, I give him a card. And that's the way it went. And all of a sudden, that John's taking over now, and the business is doing very good. Well, continued success. Yeah, yeah. I hope so. Thank you so much for your cooperation and your help. It's been invaluable. Well, thank you. A great meeting you. But this was something that was all his own, built from the ground up, and was maybe the only thing that kept him on his two feet for as long as he was.